Thank you. The original title was different, but it's the same presentation. I've just forgot to change the title. It's about the state of the PC Raster Tools plugin, but I'm going to give you a bit more context uh, about doing hydrology in, uh, in QGIS using the different tools that are available and how PC Raster fits in that uh, ecosystem. So I'm Hans van der Quast. Uh, I'll keep this one then uh, short. Um, I work for IHE Delft Institute for Water Education, where I teach GIS and do all kinds of research and projects. And I have my own company, Quast GIS. Happy also to sponsor this event. And I give support on uh, open source GIS uh, if you want uh, courses or in-house trainings, or you want uh, nice videos made for your open source tools, you can just contact me. Um, I'm co-author of the book, Huges for Hydrological Applications. I have a slide at the end about that. And uh, recently I uh, have a new course on point cloud processing and 3D visualization with QGIS. If you want to follow that course, uh, just come to me and I'll give, give you a discount uh, link. So QGIS, as you know, is a great integrator of tools. It's not just an ordinary desktop software. It really links to all kinds of other tools and that makes it really powerful also for hydrological workflows where you uh, probably don't want to be relying on uh, one specific set of tools which you have with proprietary uh, software. Because yeah, we deal with catchments, we deal with nature, with hydrography. So it's not that a one size fits all procedure will work uh, in all your cases. And with proprietary software, you're often stuck with that one workflow. Well, here you can uh, switch from one tool set to another. For example, you can use uh, Grass, Saga, white box tools, R tools, etc. These are so-called processing provider plugins, and uh, this causes for uh, users often some confusion because you're used to uh, go to the plugins manager and just install uh, the plugin, and then it should work. Um, but processing provider plugins often need an extra step because it links QGIS to uh, third-party software. So you need both the plugin and the third-party software. Uh, but we were spoiled in the past because QGIS was packaged with uh, Grass and Saga. And now that's only the case, I think, with the standalone installer of QGIS. But if you use OSDO for W or if you use it on other platforms, you still need to uh, also install uh, that other software before you can use the plugins to link it to QGIS. Processing provider plugins are really cool because they uh, use the QGIS framework uh, for uh, processing, uh, which means not just having tools in the processing toolbox available, but also uh, making them uh, useful in the graphical modeler and uh, you can use it in all kinds of batch processing. It has Python classes, uh, and if the developers uh, still wanted menus uh, or separate interfaces, that's also possible. So there was a lot of discussion about these third-party tools, and the idea um, to remove them from the installations came that core developers are very busy, as you saw also in the, um, in the opening session uh, in the presentation from Anita Grazer with uh, fixing bugs and uh, of course we want all nice new features. So also maintaining then the plugins that relate to third party software is too much. So there was a QAP, maybe Python uh, people know that you have PEP, the Python enhancement proposals. This is a QGIS enhancement proposal. These are discussions uh, on, uh, on GitHub about certain um, executive changes that, that we want with QGIS. And this was a discussion about dropping the support for certain providers and more generic to move the non-native processing providers into independent plugins that are maintained by their own communities. Um, and that caused the problem after an upgrade of Saga, for example, that uh, for hydrologists, catchment delinea is something we, we often need to do. But then when you go through the whole workflow, which I'll present in a bit, uh, the last step uh, does not work anymore with Saga because the upslope area tool, if, a bit hard to read here, but it expects a user interface, but not from QGIS, but from Saga. So therefore it will not work. Um, and there was no way that anybody would fix it. I have some workaround videos if you still wanted to use it, but this is for operational use and for teaching and even the first edition of our book used Saga, this is not good news. So I thought, okay, let's go for something more robust. And that was the basis of developing the PC Raster Tools plugin. PC Raster exists already uh, some decades. Uh, more than decades, I guess. And uh, it's uh, uh, a tool developed by Utrecht University. It came with its own native language, PCR Calc, and it was meant to build, um, build your own spatial dynamic models, like rainfall runoff models, uh, using their language. And it has all these map algebra uh, functions that you can use. And then around uh, the early 2000s, when I was doing my PhD, uh, they switched to, um, to have everything available as open source in Python. 
So it's basically a Python package which comes with a framework for dynamic stochastic modeling and uh, data assimilation. And it's uh, used, uh, the European flood model, list flood, is made with uh, PC raster, uh, this uh, PCR glob web, the in, uh, global hydrological model. And you can create your own models with it in a, a quite easy way, actually. Uh, and it comes with all kinds of extra nice things. But okay, so how could I get that into QGIS? A little bit of history. So it was my wish already since my studies, or not since my studies, because I was not so much into QGIS yet. But when I started working with QGIS, I, I missed all these nice map algebra tools. It's very good with vectors, and now a lot of raster tools are added, but still doesn't have too much. And I thought, what if we have all these around 100 tools in, of PC raster in QGIS? And during COVID, because before nobody showed any interest in, in my wish, I started to uh, work myself on that. And it was possible because uh, PC Raster supported only installations in Conda environment, and QGIS became available as an install installer in Conda. So I thought if I put them both in one environment, they can talk with each other. And that was indeed the case. So I could start developing processing tools, just like you can also do. Um, take a processing script, see how it's built up, and you see you can easily wrap around a piece of Python code that uh, just runs a function on the inputs of users and then writes the output, and it will generate the interface for you. So I did that for all the 100 tools and uh, made it available with a resource sharing plugin as a kind of prototype. And then I thought, I want a plugin that is uh, useful for, for others to easily download and a professional plugin. So. I don't do that myself because that's a lot of work to make it really uh, well. But if you did your homework and you have a good prototype, you can just go to one of the uh, developers from the community. So I went to Niall Dawson and I said, can you have a look at this and is it possible to make this in a plugin that can be released for general use? And it took him uh, one day for uh, converting my prototype to a real plugin. So that was not a high cost and certainly what I would invest in that. And then I contacted Jürgen Fischer. He's the package manager of QGIS. And I said, hey, for making it easy for users to install it, uh, Conda is not really the best option, and many people don't want to use that. So can we have it in OSGO for W? And then uh, and I asked him a quote, and then it was silent. And then after some time, he, uh, I, I got back to him. I said, I really need a quote because I want this. And he said, well, it's hard to put some money on it, but I already did it. So he just made it. <laughs> I owe him uh, free beers for the rest of his life, I guess. And uh, every update, he just packages it. And so now uh, for PC Raster users, that's great. They can use OSGO for W to install PC Raster on Windows. And for QGIS users, it's great because it runs nicely in the environment. So those were the steps needed. And then still, if you're on other operating systems, you can use either Conda or build it from uh, source code if you read uh, the documentation. So these are the type of functions that uh, are supported, and I'm not going to explain everything, but I'm going to focus on the hydrological and material transport operations. And you have to see it really like Lego building blocks that you connect together. Many of the other tools that are available from other uh, processing providers lump processes. So you want just a little part of it, but you get a lot of other things with it. And uh, this works really like Lego, where you can just connect little uh, processing things to, come to build something bigger such as doing stream and catchment delineation. I'm just going to go quickly to the general uh, workflow, because I'll explain it in the next slides. So this is what hydrologists generally need to do with GIS to derive streams and catchments. You need a DEM, you need to do some processing, you need to definitely fill sinks and remove spikes to make it hydrologically correct, so the water will flow to uh, an outlet. You need to calculate the flow direction, derive the streams, define the outlet for which you want the catchment and then convert it to your model or other tool that you want to use. So downloading open data is quite easy in uh, QGIS with some plugins. So you can use the SRTM downloader plugin for open global data. Or uh, what I find these days a little bit better and easier and more robust is using the open topography DEM downloader. It gives you access to eight different global DEMs and uh, we most often use the second one, the SRTM 30 meters. Some tools download it in tiles, then you need to stitch it together, that's mosaic. And you can easily do that by creating a virtual raster, then you don't have a copy of your whole uh, data set. PC Raster uh, has a tool which is called Resample that you could use for that. Um, it's very similar. These global DEMs come in the geographic coordinate system, and uh, that is problematic because your X and Y units are in degrees, and your elevations is in meters, and the tools will just run and give incorrect results. 
So you need to project it to a coordinate system, which also is in meters. And uh, just as a sidetrack, have you ever thought what happens if you calculate a slope? Because in mathematics, a slope, yeah, we have a curve, and then we want to have the slope of this point on the line, and then uh, we draw a tangent line, and then we do delta z over delta x, so both need to be in the same unit, otherwise it will not uh, work correctly. But now we have a raster, it's not a curve. So what, does, what happens when you push the slope button? It will use a, a focal JS operation, moving window or kernel, around the pixel that we are considering in a three by three window, and it will calculate the slope in each direction, and it assigns the steepest slope to the center pixel. So it will go like this. Yeah. So now you learned that when you cl click a slope button, it calculates the steepest slope in, uh, in the context of the surrounding pixels. And you lose the sides, there's no information. So you need to choose your area a little bit bigger. For the flow direction or aspect, it will uh, store, it will do the same algorithm, but it will store the uh, direction of that steepest slope. The DMs that you download are often larger than what you need, and then calculation time becomes tricky, especially with the fill sinks algorithm that you need to do later. So uh, you need to clip it a bit to what you expect to be the boundaries of your uh, study area. But if you make it too small, you will only notice at the end of the procedure when your um, catchment is uh, having straight linear <laughs> boundaries because the DM didn't go further. So be careful with that. Then we have voids. These are no data pixels in your DEM. They need to be interpolated. We can't do magic, but we can look at the surrounding pixels and then use the fill no data tool from GDAL, which comes with QGIS core to fill uh, those voids. And uh, you need to do that before you do any routing of water, otherwise it gets trapped. Then you need to fill sinks, which is the most calculation intensive part of the, uh, the procedure. So when DMs are uh, acquired, they have artificial depressions. They also have real depressions. But these artificial ones, they need to be removed because the water gets trapped. So you can imagine that here we have elevations, pixels with elevations. And instead of that, the water flows out, it all gets trapped into that lower value. And uh, there are algorithms that can either fill it up or cut it through. So if you look at the side, it can either fill it up or it can cut cut it through so the water will still flow out. And this is a necessary step you re need to do when you download a DEM. The problem, however, is that uh, uh, after filling the sinks, you need to calculate the flow direction. And the flow direction is a compass direction, but in a raster, we can only store values. So we cannot store north, east, south, west. So we need to store a number, maybe the amount of degrees from zero to 360. But yeah, that's not efficient if we have eight bits and we need to go to 16 bits. But the question is, do we use all the directions? And no, we use only eight directions because when we calculate slope and flow direction, we look at the eight neighboring directions. So we only need eight discrete values. There are exceptions, there are more complicated algorithms, but in fact, we need to just use eight directions and then we need to encode our directions in eight numbers. And the problem is that tools do that differently. This is called the D8 flow pointer raster. And if you look at different software, they use different numbers for these directions. So here in, with the arrows, you see the direction. So ArcGIS does one, two, four, eight. PC Raster uses the numeric pad on your keyboard. So you always have the legend of the flow direction on your computer keyboard, where uh, eight is the arrow to the north, etc. Saga does it differently, Grass does it differently. Which means if you want to mix tools, you need to reclassify the flow directions, otherwise you get really wrong results. So keep that in mind. There are other flow direction algorithms, but in science we always start with the most simple one and see if it gives good results, and then go to the more advanced ones if we need that. And therefore it's good that in QGIS you have access to different tools. So Whitebox Tools offers the most uh, options for these different uh, pointer rasters and for uh, flow directions, you can see that here. And uh, yeah, if you want to use uh, another tool, if you started your process with grass and you want to continue with white box tools, you often need to reclassify uh, this flow direction. Now these fill sync algorithms, there are also many, and in open source, of course, you have good reference to the literature where they come from. They're often named after the authors. So Saga and Whitebox use Planchon and Darbu, and Wang and Liu is very popular. PC Raster uses a different approach where you have more uh, tuning parameters. And uh, 
PC raster also does not result in the field DEM, but it results in the flow direction because normally you are not even interested in the field, the field DEM. It's just a part of uh, your uh, workflow. But if you want a DEM, you use the LDD create DEM tool. And that one uh, will then result in the field elevation model, so you can still check it. Uh, Grass uses Jensen and Domingue. Okay, uh, this is optional. If you have a stream network, you can use it to burn it into the DEM and to uh, make it more accurate at those locations. There are some tools for that. Fill burn from uh, Whitebox tools for PC Raster. I made some custom tools that you can use, and Grass has R Carve. And then after having those flow directions, you can uh, then connect them to a stream link. And then you need to calculate the Strala orders or the flow accumulation in order to know uh, where most water accumulates and you need to calibrate then where the rivers uh, are. So different tools for stream order that you can use. I'm gonna skip this method. You can watch that in the theoretical videos I have on my channel. And for flow accumulation, there are also different options from different tools that you can use. Both methods are uh, similar. And then once you have defined your outlet point, you need to make sure you define the outlet point on the delineated river because you're creating a model. So if you just click on a point on a map and it's not on the delineated river, you will not get your catchment. And it can be even under a place where you, under a bridge where you want to measure discharge or uh, some uh, water quality parameter. So as long as it's on the river network, it's, it's okay. So here are different tools that deal with that. With PIT, you get all the outlets, uh, all the depressions that can be used as an outlet. These are snapping tools to get your outlet to the river network. And these are tools to delineate the catchments or the subcatchments. So a lot of tools, and we can nicely connect them together in a graphical modeler. And I have a video on my YouTube channel where you can automate the whole procedure because lazy users just want one button. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> you still need to learn all these components because one size doesn't fit all. But if you really don't have time and under pressure, you can try this tool where you just select your study area and you put an outlet point, it will download the DEM and do the whole process. Hopefully, no guarantees because we deal with nature and can be different. There are more tools available if you want. Uh, you look for the QGIS resource sharing plugin. If I am, uh, uh, um, well, in the, in the coming days on the um, contributor meeting, I'll try to uh, get better ways to share uh, the models and the tools uh, because there are some alternatives for that. There's a nice way of visualizing flow direction because we can convert uh, the flow direction from Saga and from PC Raster to a mesh format, and then you can visualize it with arrows, and that's much more intuitive than using uh, colors. Uh, it was made uh, during a contributor meeting together with uh, Lutra Consulting. And the newest thing that you can do with PC Raster, uh, sorry, with QGIS 3.38 is raster animations. And PC Raster has these temporal layers that come out of models, and then you can animate them in QGIS using the temporal controller. That's really cool. There's a tutorial coming up for that. So that brings me to the end of the presentation. So uh, there is uh, most of the content on PC Raster is now in the second edition of the book QGIS for Hydrological Applications that I wrote together with Kurt Menke. And with the income of the book, we support uh, students from the Global South, female students to join QGIS and Phosphor-G events. And uh, we have uh, Razan <laughs> here with us and she presented also. So she's supported by the book fund. So even if you're not interested in the book, you can donate by buying the book. And uh, all the materials, course materials, tutorials, uh, the workshop that I gave before lunch uh, are freely available on the GIS OpenCourseWare platform. So feel free to use that. That's it. Thank you very much for the presentation. It was really interesting. And now, uh, are there any questions that you would like to ask? Okay. Uh, thank you for your presentation. Uh, my name is Nikita. And uh, I wanted to ask about this uh, catchment delineation algorithm. If I understand right, um, we can use this algorithm only for areas and locations where we have some slopes and uh, where we have some hills and elevation differences. But um, is there any way how we can use PCR raster for flat areas for catchment delineations? Thank you. 
Yeah, it's a difficult question, and you would expect from a Dutch person to say, yes, I got the clue here how to do it for flat areas, because our rivers are above the landscape, we need to pump up the water, so these algorithms don't work, they need gravity. Uh, the catchments in flat areas are very much uh, expert-based, so people know from very little relief where, it, uh, where the boundaries are. To automate that is very difficult, so you probably have a lot of reference data from water authorities. Uh, it's probably also your insight in where they, how they manage the water, what's pumped from one side to the other one. So algorithmic, I really don't see a way how to do that. Unless you have a very simple condition where uh, I had one case with a guy, and he was doing the, this course, and um, he, he was in the desert, and the rivers were all just a few meters below the sand, so then you don't need that algorithm. You just say everything below a certain threshold is a river, but to get the catchments more difficult. Yeah. Um, to, for the fill sink uh, algorithm of the DEM, is it possible to make like a uh, how much water is there trapped in the in the sink? You can you can quantify that. Yeah, but fill sink is needed for the artificial sink, so it starts filling it up. You can make uh, transects with the profile tool to see what the difference between the two DEMs. So you can also subtract them and get the volumes. So that's all possible. So you can get the volume, the total volume, or very local of the amount of filling of the sinks. Okay. Thank and you. with the PC Raster LDD Create tool, you can uh, control how much you want it to be filled because there's some empirical parameters for that, but it's difficult. Yeah, thanks. Hi, Hans. I had a question specifically when it comes to. I had a question specifically when it comes to blending DMs, specifically higher resolution DMs uh, with lower resolution DMs. That can be a problem when it comes to um, flood modeling. And I was wondering if there's an alternative to that. To There's a really good tool that Grass has that's called r.mblend. Um, is there anything that's available within PC Raster? No, I think there is, it would be good to use the R tool, but it all starts with um, the, the f being fit for purpose of the data set. I've mm -hmm. seen craziest things like, and now I exaggerate, like people who want to uh, to do stream and catchment delineation for the whole Amazon basin at 50 centimeter resolution. Yeah. Uh, that's not what you want. So you need to think of the scale of your catchment. What kind of data do you need? Are you calculating the catchment of a manhole? Uh, that needs to trap the water, then you have a small area, but you want a very high resolution. If you're doing uh, river systems that are generally here in uh, Europe, then 30 meters would be good enough. Um, the resolution is not the same as accuracy also, so you have to be careful. Um, but yeah, there are ways to blend it, to combine different data sets, but yeah, it's a tough topic. Thank you. Um, you show the different tools uh, that Q just provides. It's quite overwhelming. I myself develop a processing tool. Uh, it's uh, for a client, and it's just not only the hydrological analysis, but it's also how many people live in the catchment area and so many um, calculations, like there's some key elements, how many buildings, etc. Uh, and I was using uh, the Saga tools mm -hmm. uh, and in the one in the QGIS processing toolbox. Of course, after these changes, it's uh, my code uh, started not working. And that made me thought, okay, how can I make this easier to maintain? Because I don't necessarily need the UI of the geoprocessing tool because I'm writing the process and the user doesn't change anything. Mm -hmm. And my, my solution was at, at the moment uh, white box toolbox as a like pip install in the Python environment and the QGIS environment. And I'm directly using the library without any processing toolbox. That was my idea to come up with maintenance. And I, I'm independent from if QGIS makes some changes, then I don't have to change the function name, etc. What was that was the reason with the saga. And I wanted to ask you, what do you think in such a use cases, the most maintainable way to work with so different yeah. toolboxes? Well, I think your white box approach is quite similar as what I would do with PC Raster. So PC Raster, I have short lines. So PC Raster has not uh, drastic changes to be expected, it's just robust. 
And uh, also on my side from the interface, these tools stay these tools, so I don't expect anything strange to happen, and if it happens, we can solve it. And all these tools from PC Raster are Python functions, so the names are exactly the same. So if you can program Python and you can uh, write your script which does all the processing, it's even faster, and then you just wrap it around uh, a, a, a QGIS processing script, so even your user can use just the input and the output, yeah. and it will run your script. So I think you're on the right track with Whitebox. I would do it similarly. I would choose maybe PC Raster because for me it's easier. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, definitely good what you do. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, is there another question? We, I think we have time for one more. Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Sans, for the presentation. A very quick question. You, you mentioned that uh, now you support temporary layers. Do you mean in-memory temporary layers or...? Uh, no. Uh, no. Yeah, that's a bit confusing terminology. Temporal layers. A temporal, okay. Not temporary. So it's if you have a raster time series, maybe a series of remote sensing images, you can just create a stack in uh, QGIS 3.38 with a virtual raster. And then uh, you go to the temporal controller and you set uh, how you want the dates to be assigned to the different rasters. Okay. And then with the temporal controller, you can animate it. Okay, a really a cool a new feature from Niall Dawson. Okay, thank you. So thank you, Hans, for your presentation. Welcome. <laughs>